like to do is ask you to indulge me for a few minutes while I read a few paragraphs from an article that was printed in the TMI Focus in 1997 called Resonating with Remembrance by a young man named Peter Spiro. Some of you may remember this, some of you may never have heard it. I've taught in an alternative high school program here in New York City for the past eight years. I teach students who, for one reason or another, have not succeeded in either mainstream schools or other alternative settings. This is the end of the road in the part of town where only outlaws and fools travel by foot. A dozen graduates in a year is good. The graduate who goes to college is phenomenal. Things are getting worse. Last year I had three graduates. Year by year, the students get harder, meaner, more lost. No one cooks for these kids, no one seems to raise them. So they make up their own rules with codes to provide for survival. It's not a jungle because there aren't enough trees. It's a landscape of bones stripped of meat and cartilage. Kids kill each other over minor insults. The hottest career choice is to become an undertaker. When I grew up here in Brooklyn, you might get whacked with a bat, stomped, punched, your ass kicked. But you survived, you had a chance to retaliate or find another way to mend your battered ego. Not anymore. Now each decision can become your last. It's a deadly game requiring a sharp mind, quick reflexes, heightened senses, and swift, decisive action. If you survive childhood, you're a combat veteran. My goal is to help someone out of the battle. But the diploma is more like separation papers than a testament of academic achievement. Last year started like any other year. My classroom is a basement room in a building in a housing project. And there are the students, restless, disturbed, fatigued, undernourished, fearful, and on edge. So I brought a boom box with detachable speakers, spread the speakers out along the back of the room, and began one day by playing hemisync. The tape was remembrance. I expected nothing. One particular kid who normally survives each day by emulating the behavior of a monkey on a pogo stick, took up a seat at the front of the room and quietly completed each assignment efficiently and timely. Most of the class thought he was absent. Still, I doubted whether the tape alone had helped him achieve this state of contentment. But the same thing happened the next day and every day thereafter as long as remembrance was spinning in the boom box. I finally had to accept that the tape was actually performing as advertised. Even the kid knew this. He'd pass me with a wink and say, hey Pete, you're trying to calm me down with that brain music, right? And so I ordered a variety of metamusic tapes and played them all day long. The kids thought the music was weird and joked a lot about it. They couldn't understand there was no vocal accompaniment and they were pretty sure it was either Indian or Arabic in origin. They'd roll their eyes and shake their heads, but if I forgot to play a tape, they'd pipe up with, hey Pete, what happened to the brain music? Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the two people who are responsible for creating this amazing program. Each of us has our unique path to the PD. And mine is more unique than a lot of yours. I did not come from an out-of-body experience or even had not had my game plan. My journey actually began in the Edgar Casey readings, reading about sleep tapes for learning, and to actually even read about music that can even heal a brain wreck. I learned about this when I was 28 years of age, full professor at Orange Coast College, and I began searching for different ways of using music for super learning. I began then to teach other teachers how to use music for super learning. I was already an expert when the day came that all my students knew that I was looking for a tape that could synchronize both hemispheres to enhance that learning. In 1988, one of my students sent me the picture that is very famous of the synchronized brain. I told my advanced class, you want to try it? I already have 3,000 other tapes, but let's try it. The results were so spectacular, and you can read that in some of my other writing, that I then went to the gateway and my own life changed in 1988. It was in 1989 that they invited me to the professional division. And here, I learned how much I still had to learn about the brain, 
and Supreme Learning. Dr. Mohammed Sadiz first told us what hemi-sync actually was, and I found out how much I did not know about the brain. It was very, very exciting. And that was followed by Dr. Suzanne Morris. And I will never forget watching as she used something called meta music, which was music combined with hemisync, and an autistic child who could not be touched, even with music, when you added in this hemisync to the music, could be massaged and, and, and actually treated. To watch it with my own eyes, I began a search. But of course, back then, there wasn't any good meta music. And I love real good music. It was the next year that we had the artist series, the first three meta musics, and I fell in love. I started using it with my students for relaxation and meditation, working with AIDS patients, we used it for healing. So it was in the next year that I came that my own son, 10 years old, had been diagnosed as ADD, and they were going to put him on Ritalin. I figured there had to be a better way. So I started talking to the other experts in the PD. And we started to find out, well, music is the strongest form of magic. So all of you know about the importance of music before we go into the missing beta in the left brain. Uh, a lot of you may not actually understand that how much healing music, not all music, but healing music, can actually raise your T-cell levels and positive immunity up to five times. Healing music can raise your endorphin levels up to 90 times, affecting positive mood. When we combine music, good music, and hemi-sync, we're actually activating the importance of the auditory nerve in the brain. So a lot of us do not actually have a true understanding of this sensory, energetic part of our brain that all 12, 10 cranial nerves connect to every major organ in the body. That the auditory nerve is the most complicated connected nerve in the body linking up with all parts of the brain. And that our hearing through the auditory nerve has 90 times greater range than our vision. This is an important thing. A lot of people I teach, they're visual processors, but I'm an auditory processor. I get it when I hear it. So, you know, Tomatis is work as well, and we are always with our eyes at the edge of the world looking in, but with our ears, the world comes to us, and we are at the center of the universe. That's what I think we all find in not only Meta Music, but all of the brilliant tapes from the Monroe Institute. Well, back to my son. So you know that super learning music uses both sides of the brain because of all of the complexity, and that music is the one truly single whole brain event. Let us understand that music, meta music, is designer music, especially what John and I have created. It's designed to create a certain state in the body and the brain. So you all know that the delta, theta, alpha, beta, but a lot of people think that you can process a lot of the new information with alpha going through the brain. But with this new generation, and particularly the ADDs and the distracted ones, you must have beta brainwave frequencies in the cortex to anchor in new information. So, as we talk about my son, we actually, Dr. Robert Sorensen, who is also here, and he worked with a lot of children, he worked with the ADD, and I said, what can we do to help them and my son? And he told me about the missing beta in the left frontal lobe of the cortex. And I said, well, why don't we just create some beta frequencies, and I'll create a super learning music, and we'll see if it works. So he went off to create the beta frequencies, and I went off, and a student in my class, John Everson, I said, would you help me create a music that would be for super learning? So together we created, and we came back and we collaborated. Back then, I had to pay for the whole project. This was not going to go through the Monroe Institute. It was very expensive. So they created them. I was thrilled. 
I got 500 CDs, tapes, and what happened is, my son was on my first experiment, and he went out of ADD within six weeks. He graduated from high school with a B plus average and graduated from college with a B plus average. Yeah. So I started working with my students, and I told them of what had happened with my own son, explained the theories of it, and my students started using it, and they went from C's and D's in math and science up to A's and B's within six weeks. This is pretty cool. So then we started with dyslexics. They came and they asked me, well, would this work with my dyslexia? And I said, let's try. Let's try. And sure enough, dyslexia is an imbalance between the two hemispheres. And so as you got this coordinated beta wave, their dyslexia was under control as long as the music was going on. But what started to happen was they started to tell me after about six weeks, you know, I don't have any more ADD symptoms. I don't feel my dyslexia. And I kept wondering, is this a placebo effect? But I came back the next year here, and I shared my results with my students, which was at hundreds of students by now having huge success with remembrance. Well, the next year, some of the people in the um, PD went out and they started using it with their clientele. And I work with college students, so that's a very specific part of ADD. I think it's easier to rewire the brain at 18 to 25 because that is when the frontal chiasm is connecting up. And I think it's very crucial to be exposing the students to Meta Music with Beta at that time to get that frontal chiasm connected. And I think really that Meta Music, the Beta Meta Music, is one of the <coughs> best ways of doing this. Well, it was a really interesting thing. Then they started telling me, well, would it help me with my moods? And I go, I don't know, but let's try. And people started coming with stories about getting out of depression. There were so many stories. We came back and we started talking to the PD like, why would that happen? And we figured maybe the beta brainwaves were triggering beta endorphins. And then we found out. So it was a huge collaboration of many people in the PD. In particular, we uh, Brian Daly, we had Bob Sorensen, we had um, Where Are You Carmen, we had people from other countries, uh, we had Carol De La Heron, and now we have Mr. Estefano. So we took it into the colleges, we took it across the campuses, and we took it across the world. What happened is, and I was here for Peter Spiro's uh, wonderful speech, it was, it was the first standing ovation I ever saw at Monroe, because we were so inspired, it's easy for me to use Hemisync at a college campus, to know that he was having the success that he did in Harlem with people, this was the last chance school, it was so inspiring to, to hear. And I encourage you to read a lot of the articles in focusing the whole brain um, and a compilation by uh, Ron Russell. And in here you'll find the article from Robert Sorensen, and you'll find my articles, and you'll find Peter Spiro's. So Dr. Amen is the main research if you want to go check with this this dyslexia and the ADD missing the beta in the left frontal lobe, having high beta in the right hemisphere. So I think that when we added in the beta, it synchronized the hemispheres. I believe, can't prove it until we brain map it, I believe that after six weeks of this, it rewires the brain because my students say they don't have problems afterwards. So here is that famous picture that took me back to the Monroe Institute. Here is one that was actually taken of remembrance. And you'll see as the white comes at 25 minutes and spreads across the corpus callosum and then at 30 minutes on. When they talk about healing epiphanies, it's generally in this time area. I do not know who they brain mapped. It's just a really impressive picture. So what you have to understand is it's very complicated to create a super learning meta music. It's much easier to create an alpha theta delta meta music 
because you're trying to do relaxation and alpha theta. So I only started out with John to create one beta metamusic. But the popularity was so intense that three years later, it was the Monroe Institute that asked me to create a second one because they didn't know if it was John's wonderful music that was creating the effect or if it was the beta <coughs> penicin. So I asked John, who is now at USC, in the <coughs> experiment, and we decided to create our second one, which we used the Mozart effect, where all the research was going on at that point. <coughs> we had to revise Mozart. So for classical people, they don't like this particular one. But Einstein's dream, with its repeatable refrain, which John will tell you about, actually is the most effective hemi sync for learning math and science and actually rewiring especially the ADD male brain very quickly. Um, it was five years and then the Monroe Institute came and asked me to do some more because they were so popular. And I asked John, so we did Indigo for Quantum Focus, another artist did Seasons of Robert Smatton. We were trying to work with the Baroque music, which most of the research was about. This is when I started to find out that my college students, and especially if they're ADD, they did not like the rhythmic 60 to 80 beats a minute. And we started researching amongst a lot of us at the PD, and we found that the heart rate and the brain weight of this generation was speeding up. So what used to be a low beta was now a high alpha for them. So what we then started to create some faster music to keep up with them. John would do the music, I would hear it, we'd play with it, we'd take it to my college students and they would tell us what they didn't like. And then we would go back and tweak. So can you see that it was a collaborative event? But we were trying to do what Bob Monroe said. Take it out there, find out what works. Uh, Baroque Garden was done by Joshua Leeds, and it is based more on the 60 to 80 beats a minute. It's very, very, very nice. I use that more with the, the younger children. If you're using beta meta music, one other thing I want to let you know is children are mostly in theta up until five years of age, so we do not use the faster betas for them. We do not use any of the fast, faster beta music until after seven years of age when the corpus callosum is created. The newest ones, and I have to give credit to Kevin, could you stand up? Kevin Cowan. He came in 2006, and this man is another genius who really took the frequencies to a whole nother level and the music to a whole nother level. So I'll have to tell you that my students prefer, other than Remembrance and Einstein's Dream, the new ones, the new technology, the new frequencies. Kevin let me watch one time, because I don't know what they do in heavy sleep, but it's, it's brilliant and it's magical. He let me watch as he was keying in all these things. I never realized how complex the event was of putting him as in behind music. Uh, illumination, then John was asked to do that. Breakthrough and Elation are by Michael Miracle. Those are more, um, especially, I don't know why, but adult male autistics really love illumination, breakthrough, and elation. Golden Mind is the, the newest one, and the Qadar Classica. For those of you who like classical music, but also string instrument, this is the only beta that is not synthesizer as classical, and that was brought about by Carmen. We're going to keep the comments until the end, because they're going to be, I'm just trying to get through so much to get to, to John. I do not work with autistics. I was stunned to read the research by uh, Bernice Leluc and uh, Rosen. You can read about that again in Focusing the Whole Brain, where they actually used, um, so Rosen and Leluc, it's actually a longer name. So they actually used Remembrance and Einstein's Dream. Now what I can tell you, because I don't want to take all of the time to uh, talk about the autistics, a lot of the kids resisted Einstein's dream in particular for the first two weeks. They didn't want it on their ears. 
They then come in on the second week and they want, and they sit down, they do all their homework and they start changing. Does that imply some rewiring? Does that imply some adaptation? All I know is I wouldn't have used Einstein's dream, but she did. And so I learned a lot to know that I don't know everything there is to know about the autistic brain, and I don't think a lot of us do. I remember asking John Holt a lot of questions about the autistic brain because why is beta hemisync so effective with autistics? So I only have my one personal story. Uh, a student who was referred to me in, um, about six years ago, and he could not take, he had a list of diagnoses that long, he could not take any of his tests in the classroom, and he wanted to do that. He was 26 years of age. I told him what I would use for super learning, and what we had used for ADD, and he went off and tried it. He came back six months later and he said, I just, do you recognize me? And I didn't. I mean, he was manifesting quite normal. He was shaking my hand and smiling at me. And he said, I just want you to know that I took every test in the classroom last semester instead of the disabled units place, and I passed with an A. I am going on to UCI, and I go, oh, wow, could we write this up? And he says, I don't know what it did with my, my autism, but it cures my ADD. <laughs> and I go, well, that's pretty cool. And so I kept talking and asking him, well, which ones worked? And sure enough, they were the faster ones, which was an interesting thing for me. To me, the students and the clients are the ones who give us feedback. But as remember from Suzanne today, if you don't like the music, the hemisync does not work as effectively, which is one of the reasons that the Monroe Institute kept asking us to create a, so more, some more so that we had a variety for people's personal tastes. Can we all agree? If you don't like the music, it's not going to work with you. And yet, with the autistics that Rosen and Leluc worked with, somehow they didn't, they didn't even like it, but two weeks in, all of these kinds of changes started happening, which was amazing to me. So now, it was really interesting. Uh, I'm sorry Carmen isn't here. Are you not here? Yeah, there you go. So Carmen and I would talk, and she got into Brain Gym, and then Brain Gym with uh, the meta music, and it was really an amazing kind of a collaboration, and to watch how we could join. So what I think we're doing with this you have to understand, most Maddie music is alpha, theta, delta, right? So the, the designer music that is beta, which John and I have worked on, somehow more, many more than I wanted to, um, that is a very designed beta music. And the students have been the ones teaching us what to work and what doesn't. So if you want to read about the autistics, you can read this. But here's one, Ezekiel. After the first 20 days, he no longer became nervous at the sound of the tape. He concentrates more on whatever he's doing. He's curious and asking questions. He's going and doing all sorts of, of language and, and telephone numbers. He advances into another grade. While listening to the hemisync music, he makes eye contact. When the music was not on, he did not make eye contact. I remember when I was uh, speaking for Carmen, when she had a big collaboration in Puerto Rico, where she does major stuff with education all, of, all across uh, Puerto Rico. And uh, I had given my presentation about hemising, and one of the parents brought uh, Lightfall, another one's remembrance. She took it home with her five-year-old girl, the girl heard it one moment, went over, wrapped her hand around the boom box, and started speaking in full paragraphs for the first time in her life. That to me is amazing. That to me is an amazing gift that we have given because of our collaboration. And I believe that we are rewiring the world one brain at a time. And whatever invention that we have to get somebody to listen to meta music let's find them because it works so there are a lot of people here who have helped me 
along the way, but no one more than J.S. Epperson. He started as a student in my class, but went on then to the school of Thornton. Thornton School of Music. Yes, at USC. So he, a lot of you along the 20 years have asked me all these questions, and I keep saying, I don't know. Ask John or ask Kevin. Originally, I worked with Mark Serto, who was very, very good with helping me out as well. I don't know the magic of the hemisync that is behind. I just know it's powerful. And I definitely don't know the music. I just know it's the genius of John S. Epperson. Please welcome him. Hi, I'm J.S. Epperson. Um, and actually, my name is John. You can call me Jay. I go by both. Um, but the thing is that there is this performer named John Epperson who performs in New York. He does a brilliant cabaret act. And he performs his lip sync up. And for 25 years, every time somebody meets me, they're like, oh my god, are you the John Epperson? And I think, oh, they recognize me. I can't believe this. I'm like, I saw your show in New York. You look great. And it's like, ugh, oh, it's not me. So if you're ever in New York and you're off Broadway and you fancy a cabaret, uh, go catch Lip Sinka. It's a phenomenal show. I have a big poster in my office. And um, I'm grateful to have had so many exchanges where I get, uh, you know, interesting phone calls and emails about who has the right to the name John Epperson. <laughs> uh. Okay, so that's who I am. Uh, I went on YouTube and looked and said, uh, you know, how to do a presentation because I don't normally do this. And it basically said start with a sports metaphor. <laughs> Because everybody loves sports. If you don't like sports, you can start with the karma metaphor. But it just so happens that um, I was at a sporting event with my nephew uh, last September. Um, it was uh, an Angels game, uh, baseball. And uh, what was it? You know, September. It's 90 degrees. People are eating peanuts and throwing the shells on the ground. And it smells like beer. And it's hot. And it's at the sixth inning, I think. And, you know, it's, I don't. I don't know if anything's happened. I'm not a sports person. Um, and then all of a sudden, an organ came on. And it was, you know, like that. Um, and like 45,000 people stand up. They start screaming. <laughs> they start clapping. A ball moves, and it gets hit, and it goes out of the park, and something happened. And there's a part of me that's like, wow, this is, you know, this is interesting. I don't think that there's a causality here. But definitely, you know, we've, we've all responded to, to, this, to this music. Like even, I don't know, it, the, the, the pitcher, the catcher, the, the guy with the bat. Um, and it just reminds me that. You know, like us, animals, there's all kinds of animals. You know, you've seen the videos with the, um, you know, like the cockatoo that's dancing when it's, mm -hmm. you know, we just respond to music and sound. We are hardwired for that. And so I was thinking, like, you know, engaging autonomic functions of the nervous system with music and sound, that's pretty much what I do. The problem is that sounds like I'm going to present data or research. And we've seen so many great presentations today. Barbara, you know, the hard act to follow. Um, uh, Norm's presentation this morning, um, I'm not going to present data. I'm not going to talk about anything um, like important. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, you know, when people ask me what I do, yeah, there's the whole autonomic, uh, you know, sound and music response. But ultimately, what I do is I make, you know, a really good layered taco dip. <laughs> um, we take all these different ingredients, you know, like music theory, um, I'm really into NLP uh, auditory anchors, um, tempo mapping, of course the hemisync that uh, these guys put in. It's, it all kind of combines, oh, here we go, um, layered taco dip equals synergy. All of these parts end up being somehow less important than the whole experience. So the whole thing is um, somehow more important than just the little pieces. Um, so, 
beta music is what I'm primarily here to talk about. Um, and you know, the approach to beta music is different than the approach to alpha music. The music theory, the tempos, how you lead a melody, how you voice the chords, there is a difference. And this is, the beta music is really hard to craft. And I, I want to emphasize that it is crafted. You know, Barbara talked about the collaborative situation where we're playing the music for the students, the students are listening, they give us their feedback, we go back and start over or tweak, and it's a much longer process than you would anticipate. Um, <coughs> And so basically over the years, you know, although I'm not going to present data and research, um, it wasn't clever enough in 93 or 94 when we were doing Remembrance and 95, 96 when we were doing Einstein's Dream. It, it didn't occur to me to hang on to all the research we did. It didn't occur to me to, you know, we, we looked at heart rate information and we looked at brainwave scans. and. There was so much research that went into that stuff that we didn't keep. So I'm just going to throw out a few things that we've learned over the years that we've held on to kind of up in our heads and just a few little guideposts of, of what makes good beta music. And one of, uh, one of the most important things, of course, is that it has to be instrumental. Um, you can't listen to something with lyrics while you're trying to focus on something like homework or you're working on a very specific task. You need to have an instrumental. You, you miss out on what you're supposed to be doing by listening to the words. So it has to be instrumental. Barbara talks a lot about the memorable refrain. I hope that starts playing. Um, OK. So this is uh, from Golden Mind, which we did, uh, what, 2009, I think? Um, this is based on the Goldberg Variations. Uh, it's a beautiful piece of music by Bach. It's an aria, and then there were 30 different variations, all based on the same melody. Um, in a way, I think this encapsulates what's great about beta music, is that you know, normally when Barbara does her presentation, I was expecting her to do this tonight, she didn't. She, I was expecting her to say, you know, what goes in with music comes out with music. What I was expecting her to say tonight was that, um, you know, like when you learn the ABC song when you're a kid, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, we all know how that goes. And, you know, we, we hear that song when we're two and three, and for the rest of our lives, it's locked in there. This is what we're talking about when she talks about a memorable refrain. When you're focusing and studying on something, you need a series of melodies that are simple, but engaging enough so that as you're sitting there listening and you're focusing on whatever you're focusing on, that later on when you're sitting in a test going, oh, shh, that you can start humming the melody and within 30 <laughs> seconds, all that information starts coming back. Um, instrumentation, I honestly don't remember what song I picked here. Um, oh, this is Indigo, I think. Oh, because horns. Um, <laughs> So there's also an element when we're talking about beta music and beta music and Delta, where how you, the instruments that you use in an arrangement matter a lot. You can't use harsh uh, instruments with a lot of harmonic overtones. We found that um, instruments with a lot of brass, flutes, uh, a lot of metallic percussive stuff. You can get away with some percussive stuff that are on soft mallets, but like a lot of the, the steel mallets don't work. It's too brash and bright and alarming. And with uh, this track from Indigo, there's a very soft synthesized brass part. We had originally done this with um, like a, a real heavy brass sound. And the students always came back and said, God, that's like really annoying. <laughs> Um, so what we found over the years is that you've got to go for the mellower sounds. The, the harmonic structure has to be mellow. They have to be filtered down. And, you know, the instrumentation really matters. And now we're going to... Okay, this is, this is fun. 
Uh, at some point in our early research, we figured out that, uh, Barbara figured out that the key of E was really important in how the brain interprets uh, music. And it had something to do with the pineal gland, if I remember. For learning. For learning. Um, and I kind of thought she was full of it. Um, in the student tests, E always did work best. I can think of absolutely no reason why that's the case. <laughs> and then after Remembrance, and we've dealt with that whole E thing, we come back a while later and we do this piece, Einstein's Dream, based on a piece uh, called Sonata for Two Pianos in D. Um, and we ran a first couple of tests and it never worked. And students would come back and say, this isn't, this isn't right, we don't do this. As a lark, to prove Barbara wrong about the key of E, I transposed the entire thing to the key of E. And that's what you're hearing right now, is we actually are doing Mozart's Sonata for two pianos in D in the key of E. <laughs> and, you know, and I think this really speaks to the designer music thing that Barbara was mentioning a little bit ago, where this isn't about being accurate to Mozart, and this isn't about being, writing brilliant and hyper animated music. This is about writing the music that people respond to when they're doing a specific task. If they're meditating, the music has to be a certain way. If they're sleeping, the music has to have a different quality. And when they're focusing and concentrating and doing all that, it also has to have its own qualities, and somehow the key of E seems to be a, an element that's very important, and I have still no idea why that's the case. Um, auditory anchors, again, what I find interesting about auditory anchors is I didn't start studying NLP until about no, eight, nine years ago, and you know, anchoring and, and learning how to connect you know, one stimuli with another. And what I thought was super interesting was that in a lot of my albums that I did 10 years earlier, I was already doing anchoring. Um, some of these sounds that you hear come in and out throughout the piece for a 36 minute period. Um, certain melodies, and this is a, you know partly the melodic refrain, but certain melodies come up again and again and again, and those, those melodies anchor certain stimuli, if you're reading, if you're focusing, if you're engaged in activity you want to remember forever. And I just, I picked this piece because it really was something I was doing 10 years before you even heard of NLP. And it was really fascinating to me to go back and say, oh wow, there's all these examples where I did this and this happened. Um, tempo is super important to me in terms of how we mapped out remembrance. Um, it has to be greater than a resting heart rate. And this is really the last thing I'm gonna share with you tonight before we go into questions. Um, we worked on remembrance for a, a year, mm -hmm. and we really wanted to create a wave pattern, not just with the melody, but also we wanted to create a wave and an arc with the tempo. So that you start somebody in a, in a kind of a very relaxed state at a slower tempo, and then we jack it up, jack it up again, before bringing them back down. And then at the end, we found it was really important that the best response for the whole project didn't come until we figured out that we had to have a long period at the end where people could really kind of synthesize what they have been studying and focusing on in the previous 20, 25 minutes. Um, so, for every piece I think we've ever done for Beta, at least Barbara and I don't know about her other projects, but they've always had kind of a similar tempo act, uh, arc where we're kind of stimulating them a little bit more, a little bit more, and we're helping their heart rate get up a little bit, get them excited, and then dial it back down um, throughout the, the process and the, the piece of the music. Um, so like I said, that's my last slide. I have nothing else to say. Um, <laughs> So if you have any questions, I'm sure Barbara would love to answer them. Oh, well, and you, uh, you too. You <laughs> and too. you know, thank you for indulging me. I, uh, no. I had a good time. <laughs> you had a question? I just want to clarify that slide that said new beta selections. Those are the faster paced. Yes. 
the, the brains and the heart rates of the uh, college students because of the increase in media are becoming faster, more ADD, and the uh, remembrance in Einstein's dream still work, but the, some of the earlier ones are too mellow for them. They use that, they use the softer pieces for reading, studying their spelling, uh, philosophy, but they use all of the bigger ones. And there's actually, I don't know if I can say this, but there's gamma bursts in two of them. That's illumination and I think breakthrough. I know if you want to hear what a gamma sounds like, track number three in illumination, you'll hear, you'll hear some gamma. And those just seem to really work more with the college students, which is what I work with. When my students study for the SAT with beta meta music, their raise their scores 100 to 200 points, which is uh, incomparable to a $3,000 uh, study course. But you are saying over seven years old would benefit, not just college students? Oh, yeah. The, the, we don't use the faster beta music until the corpus callosum is anchored in, unless they're hyperactive, unless they're really hyperactive and they're male. So we, we use the more regular, and I'm sure that Suzanne could probably speak more to that, the more regular music for the younger children uh, to help their brains coordinate. So from 12 to 18 is the pruning of the brain. Upwards of 20% of the brain gets pruned out. And I believe that if we can expose kids to beta music and hemisync and, and meta music before that time, that they actually prune out what doesn't work and they actually go into this whole brain state, which is what I think as a, as a, a, a generation we are moving towards. Whole brainness, not left brain, not right brain whole brain and these kids think very very fast but boy do they get bored easy and if they get bored they can't learn and they can study so much longer with beta meta music yes uh, Barbara, oh, uh, John, uh, two, uh, two questions uh, one is uh, does high beta uh, from what I came across high beta is associated with uh, anxiety, uh, rumination, other things. Uh, do you try to avoid that? Yeah, that's number one. And uh, number two is what, can you please elaborate more on gamma in, uh, in this type of setting? Okay, that's more Monroe products and, and Kevin and Mark Serto. Uh, uh, we just do the music and then they do the magic of the combination. And I can just tell you from a lot of things along the way that meta music, music plus the hemisync, works a lot better than just music. One of my favorite sort of stories was a uh, adult uh, dementia home. And so the people came there and they divided them into three uh, categories. This was a PD uh, research project. And so one group listened to uh, Remembrance with uh, Beta, the other group listened to just Remembrance, and the other group listened to nothing. And after two weeks, they tested their IQ before and after, there was no difference. They were so disappointed. He came and he, sort of James would tell you that many things end up with no effect. But the anecdotal information was that not one person of the control group or the group that heard just the music ever asked to be part of the project again. All 20 of the people who had heard beta uh, meta music, so hemisync with the music, asked when they could come and hear the music again and be part of the project. All 20. So that's anecdotal about something. And for those of us who have seen Alive Inside, uh, I just believe that when you take music and you combine it with hemisync, Magic happens. Silly question, perhaps, but um, any special effects with people with perfect pitch? I can't hear you. Any special effects with people who have perfect pitch? I can't answer that. What, 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 do you, what is your intent by asking that question? 
what? Well, the whole bit about um, changing the Mozart D to the E, and I just wondered, it just popped into my head, you know, is, will they react differently? I've, I have personally found that people who are classical music purists don't like it at all because we took so many liberties with the music that there's already a resistance there. Um, I have also would think that if somebody has perfect pitch, that that may also be a, another, that, that may be a block, absolutely. Um, so, so we're not designing beta meta music to be pleasant. We're, we're designing it to help learning, but also CEOs play it behind all eight hours a day, and they just get much more done with less stress. So it needs to be interesting, but not compelling. But the students, to this for a long time, for at least a decade, Remembrance and Einstein's Dream were in the top three sellers. All over the globe. That's the thing I like about any meta music. Crosses age, gender, and culture. I think it's just wonderful because you know you don't you don't have the language problem. I have two questions. In the college student uh, procedure, do you use headphones? No. The nice thing about music is it's the one single thing which naturally synchronizes the hemispheres, so you don't have to use music uh, headphones. Uh, so a lot of the students, I tell the students that if they use the headphones, it will be a faster event, much more rewiring. So what he was meaning for me to say, what fires together, wires together, you know, the new epigenetics th uh, theme. So we are, they're studying with one piece of meta music for one subject. So each subject has a different piece of meta music. And all they have to do is think of that repeatable refrain and everything they studied will come back in 40 seconds. And this has been proven thousands and thousands of times. And how long was the average exposure? You said after six weeks you get, you could get results. But what's the well, no, some of the kids, the moment they hear the meta music, they'll look up into their head. The more that they're ADD, the more that they have a, a brain imbalance of learning challenges, they'll actually trace They'll trace the hemisync going across to the, to the left hemisphere. And then they start going, and, and I go, what are you feeling? There's, there's no programming from me. You know, I'm talking to mom about what I would use. And they say, wow, this is tickling my brain. Wow. And so then all of a sudden, they feel it. No, no programming whatsoever. We've had some examples of one kid who was uh, 82 IQ at... Uh, seven and grandma belonged to uh, Monroe so she took home remembrance and so the child uh, actually mainstreamed within a year into a mainstream class uh, then he got into the second grade and the teacher changed so he backtracked so grandma brought Einstein's dream he mainstreamed started getting A's uh, they retested him he was now 128 IQ now is that an artifact? I don't know. I met him when he was 11, and he talked to me. I said, well, can you just tell me how you feel? What happened? What does it make? And he says, oh, it just tickles my brain awake. And then he said, don't tell my parents. But sometimes I know I'm only supposed to use it for music, uh, learning, but sometimes I just want to put it on and just dance. <laughs> so the more that someone is ADD, dyslexic, and whatever, the more it works for them. But my daughter, the PhD, uses it whenever she's studying for her finals and whatever. Um, in the back of the classroom, is it two speakers or just one boom box? I actually don't use it in the classroom only because I'm so entrained to hemisync that I can't do my lectures. <laughs> oh, the children, yeah, they just do it in boom boxes and some teachers actually have a timeout with headphones for the ADD kit, so you isolate. <coughs> I did find, I tried using some of the meta music in my class, and the depressive kids got severe headaches from the, the beta trying to get up into the, to the hemisphere. One of my questions <coughs> is whether it's possible to design with a single piece of music 
variations in the hemi-sync background. Sometimes it's very hard, if particularly with some of the younger kids, to really know what makes the biggest difference. And for example, I have, I use the combination of Masterworks and Baroque Gardens because mm -hmm. it's the same genre of music, mm -hmm. but one with more of a Theta Delta mm -hmm. Alpha, the other with uh, the beta. Mm -hmm. But I would love to see something, if it were feasible, designed that would have the keeping the music constant, if that's possible, and having you know one that would have the the alpha theta delta with it, and then the two versions of the beta. I just go up, go talk to AJ. Yeah. <laughs> go talk to AJ. Find some musicians. <laughs> but if you look at these young kids, they've got young parents many of whom are in this millennial generation. Mm -hmm. And so you got to have something that fits for mom if you're using it with a boom box where both of them are in mm -hmm. the, this field. And I've wondered, I have a lot of parents who, yeah, it's all right. I like what it does for my kid, but they don't use it. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, as I listen to you, whether that may have something to do with it. My parents use it. Now, is that the way I'm languaging it? Am I so passionate about it that I'm creating a field that they keep using it longer? I don't know. All of us have to target. The good thing about Monroe products is there's a diversity. All I'm saying is understand the gift that meta music is to the world. It's a gift. And it's not just Hemisync. It's beautiful music. The artist series, these guys work really, really hard at it. Kevin is just a genius at the new technologies. I mean, almost everything's been re-digitalized uh, or something. If you have an old edition of, of Einstein's Dream, you need to get the new edition that uh, John and, and Kevin worked on. So. Each of us, we play with it, but I believe that meta music, Suzanne, whether it's alpha, theta, you don't want the kid going to delta, okay? Alpha, theta for the children, the more that they're younger or the slower betas. Uh, you know, we have to keep working with what's working. And the only, I only started out to do one, okay? My son rewired and I was thrilled. And then I was happy to have two. And from then on, it was the various people along the way at the Monroe Institute or Monroe Products who kept saying, can we have these people? And would you work with this person and whatever? All I do is I listen to it. And then I take it to my college students and make sure that they think it works for them to study with. One thing that I would like to add is that, for example, I, when I had kids in camp, I would, on Monday they came wild. And what did I put to calm them down? Sleeping music. Because mm -hmm. they were so high mm -hmm. that if I would put a, a, a remembrance on, they wouldn't pay attention to anything. It would have been awful. Mm -hmm. So what you have to decide is what is the need of the person that's going to use it at the moment, mm -hmm. because I have a, I've had experience that I'm very stressed, and I want to do a project, and I can't put Remembrance or any Beta CD because I'm so way up. Mm -hmm. I need to put Angel Paradise mm -hmm. to calm me down, and mm -hmm. then I put a, a, a Beta Frequency CD. I'm, so I'm I, I think it's important when you're working with Hemisync mm -hmm. to to imagine at the level that the person that's going to use the CD is coming and explain to them, if you're coming very anxious, you could hear a sleep, not a sleeping, but a relaxing tape when you're very anxious in the car and it's nothing that's going to happen. <laughs> but you're not going to say that. But yeah. that's the way it is. Okay, let's not use any of them in the car. No. <laughs> okay, we do not want to drive a car in an Alpha Theta. Right. Even have Uncle Phil drive the car in the Alpha Theta, so yes.
We talked a little bit about Healy music earlier on, and the, the, te the technology notwithstanding, is there a, I, I've heard Healy music a lot lately, in terms of a, a buzz phrase, if you will. And is there a is there a good definition for healing music? I mean, is there a is there a parameter for healing music? What makes healing music healing music? You want to go first? Oh heck, no! I don't want to. Do that. <laughs> I don't want. To. Okay, first of all, it's time. Second of all, it is not. We have a little bit more. Oh, I thought I thought we had until he. I thought it was. We want to in there. <laughs> Um, I actually have a conclusion somebody, somebody here somewhere. Was, somebody was giving me a, 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 a note. Um, I don't know what healing music is. I have no clue. I, I mean, that's such a nebulous term to me. In theory, all music is healing. No. No, 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 no. Uh, you, you know, when you're going to a lot of the, I'm sure you've seen Masuro Emoto where the water crystals are, are frozen and what happens to nice structured water when they're exposed to uh, uh, metal, hard, he heavy metal. Uh, the average age of people who listen to a lot of heavy metal, if you're listening to it after 32, there's probably something very hyperactive about you. And so rap is not bad, but rap with negative lyrics can be very bad. And that's why there's a lot of, of outbreaks. No, you can take people to war. Not all music is healing. I would say that most of the music that is healing has to have a wave pattern, it has to have some kind of melodic, I think it generally is on a, a major, I'm a, what is that, major key? Yeah. Not, not a, sort of not a depressive. What I love about the musicians that are coming to the Monroe Institute, the Monroe Products, like Angel Paradise, th those types of major musicians who are now saying, let's bring our music and combine it with the magic of Hemisync. And those are some of my all-time favorites. I mean, they're gifting us and we're gifting them. And we're, we're wiring the planet. And I, I admire your listening committee. Uh, I've I know you get a lot of, of submissions, and you do a really good job of, of, of a lot of the music that comes out. I'm just really, I'm a huge fan of metamusic. Alpha, theta, beta, gamma, <coughs> delta. Are we ready to maybe close our eyes for a minute? Both eyes. <laughs> if music affects us down to the DNA, I personally believe that each of our organs is singing its own song. We are healthy when our organs are singing in harmony, and we are stuck when they are singing out of tune. From my own experiences, it is clear to me that listening to meta music helps the body stay in tune. Deepak Chopra has stated that our bodies are 99.999 empty space, and it is sound that aligns that space. He further states that musicians have a responsibility to their society to fashion sounds that uplift its members and create heaven on earth. In other words, that spiritualize the listeners and color them with the divine. It is our duty to humanity to be as healthy as possible, linked as we are as ripples on the vast cosmic ocean. The state of our individual health, whether physical, mental, or spiritual, affects everyone else. Each of us is, in effect, a wave of sound that hums the tune throughout our lives. Deepak Chopra. John and I thank you. <laughs>